drauf. So as an NGO, how is it that we have translated uh, both our experience and research as well as our research findings into our various care programs? So the focus of my talk is basically going to be that. Uh, so having said that, um, So the Schizophrenia Research Foundation is uh, SCARF, better known as SCARF, founded in 1984 by the late Padma Dr. Sharada Menon, me and another doctor. Uh, we primarily identified care, rehabilitation, research, teaching, training, awareness as our primary objectives. Uh, but what we had essentially initially focused only on uh, schizophrenia and uh, severe uh, mental disorders, but as we moved along, uh, we found that there was a lot more need and demand from the community for other kinds of programs, such as, of course, community mental health, then more recently, in the last five years, youth mental health and dementia. We are a WHO collaborating center for mental health research and training, the only one in India. And we have had research collaborations with many, many um, uh, institutions all over the world. And uh, this is a book uh, I had compiled on, on our 35 years. Uh, and this kind of gives you an overview of our various programs. But what I would, because you are also an NGO, but what I would like to really share here is that it was not easy to put research on the map, even for an NGO. You know, I mean, when we first started SCARF way back, like almost 40 years ago, uh, there were a lot of people of the older generation, you know, who did not think research was important. Uh, and therefore, I had to fight quite a battle even within SCARF to say how important it is to do research and how uh, it, it would really help the science and help young people. Uh, at the same time, uh, I also had to fight my battles outside the organization because um, Whenever I went abroad for meetings, whether it was at the World Health Organization or other meetings in those years, I'm talking of the early 80s or maybe mid 80s, uh, they were very cynical about any data from India. You know, I mean, they, would all, they, all, they always thought that data from low and middle income countries was all fudged and we did not know this such. So it took a lot of my time and effort uh, and push, so to say, to convince them that we are capable of collecting very good data. Uh, it was, again, um, it took many, many years uh, to convince people about that, but now we are in a position just like Sangat is, uh, where people come to us for uh, various kinds of collaborations because they do know that we are a highly credible and uh, reliable organization. So, uh, I mean, uh, what you take for granted now, some of you young people, uh, it was not so when I started my uh, career uh, as a researcher. As Madhu had already said, this is the first study that uh, the Madras Longitudinal Study, which has completed its 35-year follow-up. This was again on first episode schizophrenia. Uh, but this started as a study of the Indian Council of Medical Research in three sites, Lucknow, Chennai, and uh, um, Vellore where we looked at a five-year follow-up of a schizophrenia. But after the five years was over, I took it upon myself to continue to follow up these uh, uh, patients. Uh, of course, as you can see, I mean, the most important things that you really need to know was all of them were living with families and are still living with, fa with families. They were all first episode. And the other very interesting finding was the uh, less than 5% had had ever abused alcohol or drugs during the entire period. And if you look at the uh, years of uh, follow-up 10, 20, 25, and 35, I'm only talking to you about the 35 years follow-up. Uh, believe me, it was not easy doing this, but we were able to follow up about 33%, but 35.6% of them had died so out of the 32, seven had committed suicide. As you all know, 10% uh, of persons with schizophrenia die very early and many of them uh, commit suicide. And if you look at the pattern of course, as all of you know, the commonest pattern of course in schizophrenia is relapses as seen in 63.3%. 
And even now, even after 35 years, we have eight patients taking treatment in SCARF and another 14 patients who are taking treatment elsewhere, which I think is not at all a bad uh, figure. As I told you, uh, deaths is something uh, that we uh, found uh, rather uh, difficult to explain, but uh, most of the deaths were uh, in fairly young people. And uh, I have put down all the uh, causes of deaths, but, but please uh, remember, I'm sure it's a case everywhere in India that uh, we don't have proper medical records. There's no post-mortem that is done. Therefore, some, in many cases, we really do not know the actual causes of death if it is due to physical conditions. And the other interesting uh, finding we've, we had was uh, after 35 years, I told you 32 persons were dead, but out of the 32, 50% were never married and 22% were separated or divorced. So the question that arose in our minds was, does marriage really protect against early deaths? And when I say protect, uh, not as a biological factor, but maybe the amount of care that is being given, uh, especially if the person is a male uh, in a marriage is much more, you know? So <clears throat> the women do bring the person for treatment and the physical conditions are taken care of. This is something that I mean, I'm looking into the data in a larger sample, but this, this is a thought that I would like to leave with some of you. Maybe you can look at your uh, data as well. So when, when it comes to translating research into practice, we did learn how to set up a cohort. And uh, uh, I must tell you that uh, what was important here was uh, why was follow-up very difficult? Follow-up was difficult because as you know, in India, there is nothing called movement registers. I can go today from one part of Chennai to another part of Chennai and I don't need to inform anybody about it, you know? So, uh, especially with all the uh, emails and uh, other things prevalent now. So uh, that being the case, it was very difficult following up uh, these people. And uh, we especially had to... Uh, when I say special needs of women, uh, when we were following up women, we had to be very careful when we were doing house visits because very often the parental family will tell us that she's married now, but the, but the husband's family does not know anything about her illness. So please do not go to her house. So these are some very sensitive issues that we need to take into account when we do house visits, especially for uh, women patients. And monitoring physical health we found was extremely important because many of them fairly young in their lives had had physical uh, ailments, which led to their death. Then going on to my PhD that was on disability and schizophrenia. And uh, at that time, disability was only associated with other physical and sensory disabilities. Uh, so when I did this disability, my main finding was that the focus was on occupational functioning and disability. If you ask a family, what is it you want to happen to your ward with, with a problem, they would say, it does not matter if he smiles to himself or talks to himself, but we want him to go to work and earn some money and be, be able to support himself or his family. So this was one of the main uh, uh, findings. And the other, other thing which we of course found was there is absolutely no disability benefits in our country at that point in time. So this, uh, because there were no disability benefits, I thought that we should really lobby very hard for that. And that is when uh, a staff lobbied in a very big way with the government of India, and then uh, mental health, mental disability got uh, recognized and, and it was treated on par with other disabilities. And when the question came up, how do you really measure this disability and how do you convert it into percentages? Uh, we started work on ideas and that is how the ideas came into being. And now it is the only instrument which is officially recognized to measure uh, mental disability. And we also developed another tool called BAS, which is a burden assessment schedule of SCARF to assess the needs and burdens or burden of the family. Then we move on to another very interesting, very topical subject is recovery in schizophrenia. As you all know, there are recovery-oriented clinics all over the world. 
And uh, therefore, we started studying what is it that actually constitutes recovery and what is it from a client perspective and what is it from a family perspective. And uh, the very interesting thing here is if you look at what I have circled there, not having to take medicines anymore, that is considered recovery. I'm sure most of you know, patients come and tell you that. And to become independent, uh, be on their own. And as I said earlier on, to be able to hold a job and to express or understand emotions such as love or whatever it is, because that's so important when a person lives in a family. I'm sure very often you've heard of uh, parents telling you that the father is dead, but this guy is not showing any emotions at all. And people are wondering why this is happening. So this is equally important for the family as it is for the person suffering from the disorder. One second, what's happening? So there were gender indicators of recovery and uh, uh, for many women, they felt no medicines. If I, if I don't have to take medicines, that means I'm okay. That means I'm recovered. And for the men, it was holding on to a job. So uh, uh, much as you tell them that you are taking medicines because you're ill, somehow that logic doesn't seem to work in their minds. So uh, again, we found that we have to prioritize recovery-oriented interventions and use patient-centric language. And engaging the patients and the family is very, very important in the recovery process. These are all things that we uh, learned through all this research and we applied in our day-to-day -day clinical practice. Then we did a small uh, program on uh, advanced directives in psychiatry. As you know, that this is a very important part of the Mental Health Care Act now. And uh, we did a pilot actually for, uh, for the government. And we said, uh, we found that many, many people were actually able to understand the concept of uh, uh, advanced directives, much as we thought that they may not. Uh, many of them did understand and they were able to respond to where do you want to get treated? Do you want to go to mental hospital? Do you want to go to a private practitioner, staff, whatever? What treatments do you want? Many of them were categorical in saying, I do not want ACTs ever, you know? So, uh, and then do you, do, you, do you have any other treatment related specifications? Like there are people who said, I don't want to take clozapine. So they were able to indeed able to understand what these advanced directives was and they were able to respond well much to a surprise, and uh, we, we gave this feedback. So, and this is what I said, this was a pilot attempt, and now it is being used in SCARF uh, as a part of routine clinical practice where we do uh, ask all of them to uh, about their advanced directives. Then another very interesting group of studies we did was studying abnormal movements in untreated schizophrenia. See, we always associate abnormal movements with medication, but uh, starting from Kreplin, uh, it has been clearly documented that many uh, chronic uh, uh, persons with chronic schizophrenia have a lot of abnormal movements, although they, there was no uh, neural leptics at that point in time. Uh, therefore, we did study uh, people who have never been treated and compared them with people who had treatment and we studied the, we looked at the abnormal movements. And uh, we also did MRI studies on them and found definite uh, pathology in the lentiform nucleus. Uh, and uh, uh, the, we found a lot of striatal pathology in, uh, uh, in, a, in a subgroup of persons with schizophrenia. And this was published at the, in the archives of general psychiatry. And we again replicated this in between 2004 and 5, and we found dyskinesias, we found Parkinsonism, we found a lot of these uh, abnormal movements in persons who have never, never received any medication, showing that it is an integral part of the disorder. So uh, what we really did was when we did this work in the rural community, we found that they really needed care and care programs. So we initiated a community mental health program in that area. So this is a community mental health program. Uh, 
uh, which we started way back in Antirapodur. Uh, the one thing I want to say here is many people think that community mental health is delivering care or distributing medicines or whatever outside a building, you know, or outside a regular building, say like here, it's below a tree. But I think that is uh, not a right concept at all. That's not a proper understanding of what community mental health is. And in my mind, community mental health means involving the local community in all your activities and empowering the local community to participate in your programs, in your care programs or in your PSR. It is not merely a shift of your venue from a building or in the city or to rural area, but it is the role that community, that the local community plays. I think that is the most important uh, point that I want to say here. We uh, followed up uh, one uh, community where, you know, after 10 years, we went back into the community because we really wanted to see what was happening. And just like we had expected, most of them had, many of them had stopped treatment. Some of them had gone to the a state uh, facility, but they were not happy there. Uh, therefore, I mean, we, we published this in the International Journal of Mental Health Systems just to show that how sustainability of a community mental health program is so important, especially for NGOs like us. So that is when we actually started thinking of telepsychiatric clinics. We started uh, them in order to improve access. We did a lot of home visits and even conducted regular psychoeducation. Uh, so the very interesting thing we did was in the local community, we started a revolving fund where a certain amount of money was kept and patients who wanted to start small businesses could really borrow money and go on with their uh, rehabilitation. Then the COPSI trial is something that all of you in Sangat must know because Sangat was a collaborating center and uh, this was to again evaluate the cost effectiveness of a collaborative community-based care intervention vis-a-vis -a, -vis a facility based care. The three centers, uh, uh, I mean, I'm sure you know, uh, intervention was provided by the community health workers in, in Chennai and uh, a, a lot of a lot of work was done in all the sites and we developed some excellent manuals uh, for the working with persons with schizophrenia. And this is all the COPSI intervention material. I'm, I'm happy to say that a lot of this material is being used in other sites and in other places. And uh, while definitely uh, things improved with the intervention, uh, the improvement was a little more in Chennai than it was in the other sites and uh, disability did improve uh, marginally, not, not very much, but it did improve. And the very important uh, output of uh, COPSI was a consent procedure. Uh, Sudipto was largely responsible for this and he brought out all these pamphlets which are being used. How do you explain informed consent to people who are illiterate? Like this is tossing of a coin and, and so on. So these are, uh, again, uh, I'm happy to say that these are being used in other parts of the country now. So we did not stop with research. All the outputs of research, like the manuals and training pro procedures and the flip charts have, are all being used in the various community mental health programs, not only in SCARF, but in other uh, places as well. Then um, some of you might have heard about our telepsychiatry program in uh, Pudukote. Pudukote is, was one of the lesser developed districts in Tamil Nadu. And uh, so the bus that you see is our mobile telepsychiatry unit and the bus went from place to place. And uh, the doctor was sitting in Chennai and uh, community level workers were in the bus and uh, the, the doctor was able to see the patient and prescribe medication. And then the community level workers did all the uh, PSR bit. So we had fixed line clinics and we had mobile telepsychiatry clinics, uh, both of which were extremely well received by the uh, persons in the catchment area. Um, what we really found was that uh, not that there was no dropout, but 
if we are able to ensure three consecutive clinic visits to a clinic, then we're able to hold on to the patient. And that may be true even of your regular clinics. You know, so this is one big lesson that we learned. So somehow keep them with you for three clinics, three times, and then they're, I mean, they're there to stay with you uh, for the large part of the time. So this knowledge uh, um, from telepsychiatry really helped us do a, a clinic during the COVID pandemic. And now, of course, telepsychiatry is done every week uh, as a routine and scarf. It's part of our routine uh, clinical services. And as I said, we try our best to make sure that they are, part, they are there for three consecutive visits. Then next, the other program that we are currently doing now, it's called the Intrepid. And it basically looks at incidents, presentation, outcome, impact of psychotic disorders. The three sites are, again, Chennai, Nigeria, and Trinidad, with uh, KC at the King's College being the coordinating site. Uh, so I'll skip this, I'll skip this. Basically, uh, we looked at prevalence of schizophrenia. It was a little more than women uh, in Chennai. It was not the case in, in the other two sites, but in, in India, we found women, slightly higher prevalence in uh, women. There were definitely more untreated persons with psychosis in India compared to Nigeria or Trinidad. Of course, the family was involved in the health seeking process. Uh, and uh, in Nigeria and India, two-thirds sought non-medical help. I'm sure most of you know that it's either religious or traditional uh, medicine. Uh, and uh, the types of services varied over different visits and over period of time. And cannabis was a very important factor in Trinidad, but not in the other two sites. But a very interesting uh, piece of finding we had here was we always thought that a proximity if, if they did not see care because they did not have a hospital close to them. But this, this study proved that that was not the case. People were prepared to travel all the way and come to the Institute of Mental Health, but they did not want to seek help from a hospital which was close to them. Whether it is stigma or what is something that we are going into, but this is a very, very interesting uh, out of the ordinary finding that we had when we did the analysis. Of course, we, lot of, we did a lot of other activities like distributing food, provisions, relief packages, and so on. And uh, what did we learn? We, we learned that we have to co-design interventions with people with lived experience, and we have to work in partnership with the public health system. Because in order to make our programs more sustainable, we have to really uh, have a tie up with, with them. Then we have a first episode clinic. We have done a lot of research on early psychosis and first episode, uh, mostly with Montreal uh, in Canada and, and then with uh, England, uh, with, uh, funded by the NIHR. We have a proper protocol for treating first episode psychosis and we have a first episode clinic in SCARF. So as I said, we started a first episode psychosis program and we have developed protocols for the management of uh, first episode psychosis. Uh, many people have asked me, how is it different? It is indeed different. The management of first episode psychosis is indeed very different from a non-first episode psychosis. I mean, there's no time to go, to go into this, but this is something that we have learned along the way. Then this was a WIC study, which is Warwick, India, Canada study. Again, this was uh, among young people in educational institutions in Chennai, where we estimated the prevalence of depression, anxiety, and psychotic-like experiences. And uh, we were able to screen as many as 15,000 students. Uh, in 10 schools and six colleges. And these were all the uh, instruments that uh, we had administered. And we were pretty surprised and almost shocked to find that almost 30% of them scored on depression and about 25% of them scored on anxiety. And uh, I mean, and 30% and in, in among the youth is really quite a a uh, high number when it gets translated into absolute uh, figures. 
So we went ahead and we started a youth mental health service, which is very much a part of SCARF now. And we work in a lot of academic institutions. We work with families and communities and with the youth themselves. And of course, we have developed uh, peer support in education institutions. Uh, of course, that's being done in other parts of the country as well. But what we have found is, although there is initial enthusiasm with the peer support volunteers or peer support workers, there is a need for continued mentoring of the peer supporters. Um, uh, for various reasons, uh, this becomes a very, very essential. Then we also have a youth safe space, which is a youth resource center, uh, where uh, we, uh, it is, this is in a relatively non-stigmatized setting. It is not in SCARF, it's another building. Uh, therefore, uh, the youngsters are uh, more ready to come and take part in various activities. And we've also highlighted on uh, youth leadership and found some exceedingly good youngsters so all this led to, as I said, led to the Department of Youth Health to provide all this uh, mental health literacy and screening and so on. We have established a youth advisory panel <clears throat> and developed youth friendly spaces and a youth support program. Then we also went on, I mean, we have done a lot of genetic studies for over 15 years uh, with the University of Queensland. And uh, we, but I'll tell you what we really found. Uh, we found that this was a great finding. We found that there was defective niacin regulation in persons with schizophrenia. So having found that, we have now started, we've completed a pilot study on niacin supplement but we have also initiated a RCT uh, uh, using niacin. And uh, I believe that even if 40 to 50% of people on niacin make some improvement, especially as far as negative symptoms are concerned, I think that that's a great thing. You know, that's a great finding by itself because we're all the time struggling. Uh, although there are many new drugs, we still don't have that wonder drug for uh, schizophrenia. Then from youth, we have also uh, now done a lot of dementia work. I mean, I'm aware of Sangat's work as well in, in dementia. We have a clinic, we have a daycare program. Now we have a 20 bedded center exclusively for dementia in a person in a place called Tambaram on the outskirts of uh, Chennai. So we have done a lot of dementia research like uh, CSTs and adaptation of various interventions. And we have done a lot of rural interventions for dementia as well, as part of many programs uh, sponsored by the Indian Council of Medical Research. So this is one of the more uh, interesting findings where we have a hybrid phase robo and uh, we uh, get this guy to you know, engage persons with dementia. Uh, and uh, we found that many, many of our elders who are otherwise unresponsive really uh, took a liking to this chap and really started responding to him. Uh, so we are now trying this out on a larger scale. So that is it. And uh, I mean, I think I have told you so much starting from youth to uh, uh, dementia and I've told you how we have been able to translate our findings. And these are all our, uh, we are acknowledging our uh, research collaborations, both international and national. We have done quite a lot of work with Sangat and with Ames in Delhi. Uh, so that is it. And as I told you, the, the title of my talk was Agony and Ecstasy. So as I said, the agony was the initial 10 years of staff. A lot of energy had to be spent in fundraising, building infrastructure. There is no sustained flow of funds. And we had to do the delicate balance between care and research. And at that time, uh, very few centers taught research and very few, there were very few teachers of research methodology, you know, unlike now. So uh, that became a very uh, huge drawback as well. Uh, of course, ecstasy being, we have established credibility nationally and globally. We are a WHO collaborating center. 
And we have been able to expand our activities from psychosis and severe mental disorders to youth mental health and uh, dementia. And then we hold the, pro, uh, the conference called ICONS, which is a biannual conference. Uh, and we teach uh, students, uh, diplomat of uh, <clears throat> health. And we also are engaged in, uh, we teach many other uh, uh, students for various diploma courses. So uh, these are all my colleagues at SCARF. We started with, uh, we started in 1984 with exactly two staff, one part-time psychiatrist and one psychologist. And I'm happy to say that this is where we are. And uh, I'd like to acknowledge two of my colleagues who helped me with this presentation. And one of them is Sujit John and the other is Grishma. So I would stop here and I'd be happy to take questions. Thanks so much, Dr. Tara. I mean, <laughs> it's such an incredible professional journey, really. But more than that, I mean, it's just I really liked how you at every step took us through how what you found kind of linked directly to practice. So that that, that was really that was really good to see. So um, so I'll just open this up for questions. Yes. Hello, ma'am. Yeah. Yeah, I'm Ashwini Yom. I'm from Vijay. I'm saying Vijay Biotech at SVC now. So, Sorry, I can't hear what? you very well. Ashwini, we can't really yeah. hear you. Yeah. Now, can you hear me? Yeah, is it fine? A little better, maybe? Yeah. Yeah, hello. Yes. Is it okay? Yeah, yeah I'm, a biotech student. I'm a Biotech student, ma'am, studying at SVC. So mm -hmm. from childhood, I was very curious to work as staff now. Mm -hmm. So uh, regarding the research of uh, genetics of schizophrenia in those uh, areas. So in what way can I be able to uh, make myself uh, ready to do that? And what what will the expectations uh, you have to be a part of staff? Can you get <laughs> well, this is not really related to my talk. So maybe we should have a private chat about this. Okay? Yeah, I sure I was trying no, no, to no, Please feel free. Uh, my email ID is available. My phone is there. And please feel free to write to me and I'll we can certainly have a talk about this. Yeah, sure. Thank you so much. Yeah. Gauri, go ahead. Yeah, hi. So first of all, Tara, thank you so much for this wonderful uh, a journey of 35 years and I can see where so much of the work that we've done uh, that I am doing now in early child development disability the yeah. many threads of inspiration come from the scarf work that uh, you know the the work that we've done with scarf so in including you know the illustrated um a consent form etc that we do use uh, you know even in our uh, autism trials um, so first of all, thank you. I think what was also really interesting for me, uh, you know, is to see how SCARF has managed to, um, you know, bridge these two areas, both of research, but also of being an implementing organization on the ground, which is a service delivery organization. And I think that maybe is one, I think, critical difference uh, between, say, the work we do in Sangat and SCARF in that we really are, uh, you know, we are not actively providing services. We do have service providers, but I can't say we are known for service provision as an organization, which I think SCARF has really managed to, um, you know, manage these two areas with, uh, with great skill. Uh, my one question is really going to be around the cohort and following up cohorts. Yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, we have two cohorts that I'm uh, working with in, in, in the child development group in Sangat. One is children that we followed uh, from um, birth uh, mm -hmm. and they're, they're now approaching seven next year. And we've managed through smaller funding cycles, you know, keeping the cohort active and moving. Um, but this is in Hari rural Haryana. We have very high rates of, uh, you know, retention. Mm -hmm. The next cohort that we have is uh, going to be an autism cohort of 240 children, again, very precious, but is going to be in Delhi. 
And so I just thought that, you know, you've worked in Chennai, but also in the rural areas of Tamil Nadu. Are there any clear differences between, you know, following up cohorts? Are there any strategies you feel one could keep in mind as we go ahead? Uh, because, you know, you had some very good uh, follow-up um, rates. You know, what, what would yeah. be the tricks to keep cohorts, uh, uh, you know, in, in, uh, in your sphere and, uh, you know, in your connect? would be very useful, yeah. I think, me to find out. No, Gauri, in rural areas, it's easier to follow up because for one, a migration is less there. And even if people migrated, then there's always somebody who knows about it, who, who, who knows where have they gone and they are in touch. Uh, because it's, uh, it's much more of a clo close knit society there. But in an urban city, that's not the case. Sometimes we don't even know who our neighbors are, you know. So um, it, it becomes difficult to get other people's help. You just can't ask the person next door and say, do you know where this person has gone? And they'd say no. What we do is we take three to four addresses for every person we enlist into our program. So even if that one, the primary family moves, then there will be somebody like the aunt or the uncle or the grandfather or the cousin who will be able to give you that information as to where they have gone. I think uh, that becomes uh, extremely important. But now if, if you are dealing with Delhi, then you, are, you might have their email IDs. And I mean, I do not know what kind of uh, socioeconomic class you're dealing with. Uh, but if you are dealing with middle and upper economic groups, then you can certainly, you will have their email IDs and you will have other ways of reaching out to them, which would be, uh, uh, which would probably give you a better uh, follow-up rate. But I think more important is the kind of relationship that you establish with the child and with the family. I think that really is so important. In your case, it's, it's probably more the family but if the family does come to appreciate your inputs and the role you play uh, in their lives, I think they'll take the trouble to keep in touch with you. I mean, this yeah, is something that yeah. I can think of right away. Yeah. yeah. No, thank you, Tara. I think this, this very interesting idea of three to four addresses is really interesting, particularly if you take a village address. Because, you yeah. know, one of the things that we saw definitely in terms of, which was very interesting is, uh, you know, during COVID, is people just abandon telephones. You know, we all say everybody, but yes. you know, unlike a landline, which yeah. is so used to be so precious when I was growing up, which was of course many moons ago, like yeah. you never abandoned your landline. Yeah. But you know, now the cell phone is so easy to discard. Uh, you know, you can't pay for it, which you know, many people went through financial difficulties and you just drop the cell phone and it's gone. So I think the phone and the urban address has become quite a, a difficult a thing to be tracking people with. But I think this idea of getting, you know, a, a multiplicity of addresses, uh, you know, just for people attending, we have done some interesting things because these are children. What we've been doing during the trial is we've been sending out a trial newsletter. We've been also sending birthday cards to the children. So, you know, we've been trying to keep them engaged in a way, but, you know, it's always complicated in the treatment as usual arm. So the control yeah. arm is always, uh, you know, never as satisfied, yes. uh, particularly, you know, in early child development where the assessments are quite long. Uh, you know, these are not short assessments. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, they do often feel like, but we haven't really received much from you guys. So yeah, these are these are side complexities, but you know, it, I, I think this one takeaway is really very useful. So thank you for that. Yeah. Any other comments or questions? I'll come back in since uh, there, there doesn't seem to be. So the other thing, Tara, I suppose, is you managed a really good, um, you know, the service delivery aspect. Now, research, you know, I think like Sangat Scarf, you know, goes to international competitive awards for research. But I'm wondering, you know, how do you keep your services active? Uh, you know, how do you fund those? 
uh, that would be something that would, I think, be quite interesting for us because I think we ourselves are now achieving a point where, you know, we've done a lot of intervention development, et cetera. Now we're at this point where we have interventions that we can put in place. But service delivery, at least in the context of a place like Goa, you cannot generate the income, you know, to keep services going. Um, it's a pretty well um, resourced state uh, in the sense that there are lots of hospitals, there are lots of private practitioners. We know they're not doing great stuff, but they're, in, they're there. So, you know, to keep salaried people on service uh, provision, service delivery provisions, I would love to hear how SCARF has managed, you know, this particular uh, challenge. Yeah, there are a few ways in which we have managed. One is, see, all our donations, most of our donations uh, are primarily geared uh, at improving services. So, uh, Whatever we collect from, say, corporates or uh, all that money gets into a corpus. And uh, uh, Gauri, we have three residential programs. We have mm. a total bed strength of 135 patients. That's amazing. So uh, across three centers, and now we have a 20-bedded dementia facility as well. Mm. Uh, wherever we have the uh, service program mm -hmm. linked to a research program, we kind of divert some of the research funds into the service program. Mm -hmm. But that again is short-lived, as you know. You know, it's yeah. just as long as the program lasts. But, but every other source of income that we have in terms of donations or, I mean, we, we again provide mostly free services. Mm. Uh, that, that's the other problem that we have. They are all uh, channelized into improving services. But mm. it is a challenge. It's a challenge everywhere because uh, we we, do, we don't uh, take fees as such. You know, we mm. just take a registration of 250 rupees. But the psychiatrist time, the psychologist time, all the tests, everything is pro bono. So, mm. I mean, so therefore it is a challenge. Uh, but somehow uh, we have managed, you know. And uh, But one thing, let me tell you, donors are happy to fund service programs. They are not happy to fund research. Mm, mm. so especially the old time donors you know <laughs> so if you say i'm going to look at 100 children and and find out what kind of disabilities they have and help them then they'll they'll give you some money mm. or i start i want to start a clinic for uh, uh, children with uh, uh, i mean who are differently abled or whatever it is then they they would they would come up with uh, some funding for that but but not for research. I mean, that's where you you you're actually be walking a tightrope there. You you've mm. got to ask, you've got to be sure who you're asking what, you know. Then then it uh, uh, for example, this dementia center that we built, mm. uh, we were able to uh, get money from just three corporates, you know, about five crores. Mm. By saying that we are starting a facility for persons with dementia. Yeah, and I think, you know, Tara, very interesting because I, I think, you know, this is also the challenge for us in uh, Goa because Goa, Goa is a very small state. Yeah. So I think the kind of funding I can see in Bombay for, say, early child development, what I'm hearing from, a, you know, a city like Chennai yeah. of, you know, a more severe mental health disorders. Mm -hmm. um, so, I, I mean, I definitely, and, and it's almost like chicken and egg. You know, you need a pot of money first to start a service yeah. Uh, and then that, you know, and then you show the service working well. So interesting challenges, but no reason not to think of them uh, as next steps. Yeah. Thanks, Kari. Dr. Tara, can I ask you to look at the chat box? There's a question for you there. Okay, okay. Maximum functional recovery of the 32 or the 32 persons. Yeah, the maximum functional recovery. I mean, um, I don't know how to, uh, I mean, I, I don't want to give it in percentages, but if you look at uh, one third of the people who had, uh, whom, whom we were able to follow up, half of the one third were not functional. In the sense, they were totally dependent on their families. But the other half uh, were quite functional. They were uh, 
they were in jobs, uh, the women were okay, they were doing their, uh, they were able to take care of the family. And um, it was a 50-50 at the end of 35 years. And, and you know, you have to keep in mind that at the end of 35 years, many of them have also become fairly old. You know, just like me, they also <laughs> become aged. And therefore, not ma many of them were even expected to work at that point in time. But I should say there is a good amount of functionality in only 50% of the pay, uh, cases that we were able to follow up. And what was the, any other question? Uh, hi, Dr. Tara, this is Arjun. Yeah. Hi. So my small query about this, uh, the today presentation, you uh, had a, uh, uh, we had a like a lot of information and got to learn a lot of things today. But I, my just query is like you mentioned in a presentation that research and uh, community services go hand in hand because you find something and you make a changes in your in your practice or your service facility, which uh, which which benefits or brings uh, a more uh, what you call as uh, a refinement in your services or the facility that you provide. But uh, can we be sure that the uh, the research that is conducted in the or the uh, model that is built in the Tamil Nadu can be replicated or can be implemented in other states where the uh, where the awareness or, or the practices about the mental health is very low or very nominal? I'm talking about the backward states of uh, of India. So how what will be the challenges that can uh, that can be uh, that we can face and how research can help uh, to bridge that gap. See, Arjun, there are many models of care that many NGOs have developed and, uh, and certainly they can be scaled up or they can be replicated. But you will be surprised uh, to, I mean, when I say that, when I say this, we, we did a program uh, in Bihar. Uh, we worked with a local NGO and we were working with uh, women with uh, antenatal and postnatal depression. And uh, much to our surprise, we were able to train the community level workers and the uh, ASHA workers there. And they were so quick on the uptake uh, uh, in order to, you know, to recognize and to support these women uh, with postnatal depression. And they even used, uh, they used apps. Uh, wherever possible, you know, they, or they used telephones, they used hotlines, uh, they were even tech savvy to a certain extent. Uh, so sometimes, you know, even in uh, uh, very uh, states which we consider pretty remote, you do find uh, persons with extreme amount of, you know, a flair for this kind of thing and a commitment to serve their society, it is definitely there. Uh, but yes, of course, awareness is low. I mean, there are the usual. Uh, uh, reasons that we know for people not accessing uh, care. But I think we can, it is possible to work around most, most things if you have a basic model on which you can build your uh, system of care. And research again is up to you to do what kind of research. You, you will have to tailor the research to the actual needs of the community there. What is it that you need to understand about the local community in order to improve your services? If you have that mindset, then it is possible to uh, intertwine your research program with your service delivery program. I mean, there are any number of instances where uh, not only we, many other organizations have been able to do that. I mean, for example, in tuberculosis or you know, uh, in HIV, uh, it, this has been possible. I think there's uh, one more comment, uh, Dr. Tara from Rajkumar. Yes, yes, I'm reading that. Yeah, okay. sure. Yeah. It's very difficult to say uh, with what career fits whom. I think each, uh, whether you are somebody who has experienced lived with schizophrenia or, uh, or been totally you know, unaffected by any mental disorders. Each person is different when it comes to suitability for a particular job. And I think one that has to be assessed. But 
for example, if you want to, uh, you say that you have done your MSc psychology and uh, you've had a problem. Um, yes, you can take up a career related to mental health, provided you know, uh, provided you are sure that you're not putting yourself through too much stress. You know, I mean, I think that is that really is a bottom line. Even when we place people in jobs, that is what we look at because too much stress, uh, it just breaks them. You know, I mean, the, the delusions return, the hallucinations return, everything, everything returns uh, despite medication. So it has to be a slightly low stress job uh, for persons. In if you're looking at uh, placement of persons. Uh, with mental illness, serious mental illness in jobs. Uh, then, of course, you need proper job coaches and, you know, uh, who will go and talk to the employers uh, regularly as it is being done in the West. In India, we don't have uh, such a tradition at all. Very, very unfortunate. But I think uh, uh, these things really matter. Okay. So, Madhu, there are no more questions. Can we stop? Yes, sure. So, yeah. can I just add to something that uh, Gauri said, just as the last remark? Like, I, I mean, she's, I think she's kind of hit the nail bang on the head when it comes to uh, this point that she made about how scarf is kind of this kind of, you know, like it's a right bridge between like research and implementation. I think that's that's really missing in Sangha. And uh, it just, when you have things that see, when you have an opportunity to make changes immediately based on what you're actually doing, uh, it, it makes you very close to the ground realities. I think that that is a big like miss in Sangat. Like sometimes I feel like our research kind of, we don't know where it goes because although we work with a lot of other organizations that may be implementing what we have found, we are not actually doing it directly ourselves. So the, the feedback loop is, is not a direct one. And uh, I mean, it's, it's really fantastic to hear, like I said, like how each and everything has actually translated into something on the ground for you guys. So thanks so much. Thanks so much for sharing this really incredible, really incredible journey with us. Thank you very much for the good sharing all of this with you because you will understand what it really means yeah okay okay, okay. thanks everyone for for coming to the session and i really hope you enjoyed it thank you thank you thanks everyone